If you start where the mouth of the river opens into the Bay of Bothnia, you will be in the town of Karlix. The river runs smoothly here. It is good to walk up a river. It's easier to go down by boat or canoe, but better to go up. Do you have a map? Vit vattnet means white water. You can get good fish there. You will pass Morjärv. Mor means mother. Järv is Finnish for lake. Between Morjärv and Svartbyn, there are some cascades. They're not as wild as they used to be. They were dynamited so that the river would not flood Erva Karlix in the spring, making the town into an island. When it did, we had to go to school by boat. Perhaps someone can give you a hand with the boat and you can rest a while. The magic starts just south of Svartbyn. Walk slowly. If your shoes are worn, see if someone will row you across the river to the deaf mute's house. He speaks in gestures and is skilled when it comes to fixing heel and sole. Seven kilometers of pine wood stretch between Svartbyn and Grelsbyn. Grelsbyn is not on the map but you will recognize it from my description. I was born there. When I learned to spell, I liked to figure out the meaning of names, but there was one name that I could not understand, the name of the river Karlix. It was not until I was 31 years old that in a dream, a large book opened, and on that page, it was written that Karlix was the Latin word for chalice. There was a bright light around the book, leather-bound, gold-lettered. When I woke up, I looked into the encyclopedia. The word that I, as beginning reader, had thought foreign because of its X was there. Carlix, Latin for chalice, just as the dream had shown. Right, to continue, there are three islands in the river outside Grelsbyn. One is named Fær Holmen, Sheep Island. There must have been sheep there once. It is a long, narrow, grass-covered island inhabited mostly by swallows. On the north end, a long tongue of red sand sticks out upriver. It was there that Papa taught me to listen, to lie down on the sand, close my eyes, and listen. You can swim to Sheep Island. I have done it. It is tough swimming. One must swim upstream all the time while swimming across fighting the current. Southwest of Sheep Island, there is an island, Starholmen, where only lily of the valley and wild black cher choke cherry trees grow. 
We used to go there once a year to pick Lily of the Valley. Maybe I, I told you how the farmer who owned the island burned it again and again so that grass would grow? But only Lily of the Valley grew. The third island, still Sandon, the big sand, a few pussy willows grow in its centre, and when you follow the shore across from Stool Sandon, you will see many dragonflies. We used to cover our ears with our hands when we walked there because we believed that dragonflies wanted to get into our ears to eat the wax and bewitch us. <laughs> Walk slowly through Grelsbyn, the first red house with white corners and green and white trim is Kristinas. I think she's still living. That's where I used to get milk. The grey house is the one I would like to fix up to live in one summer. The light green house is grandfather's and his father's before that. The light house on the hill is the house my father built for my mother when they were engaged. Then Claras, a red house. Clara Krista, dressed up as a ghost one night to try to scare us. <laughs> a white sheet overhead and a candle in her mouth. Then Clara Fina's house. She had many children, the youngest a pair of identical twins. Her husband has been in an asylum as far back as I remember. The reason he was put away, and the only reason I ever knew, was that he used to play the violin all the time. The violin. <laughs> then in Nabaris, in the mountain, where a girl died of tuberculosis. In the patch of woods between in Nabari and the next house, there is a large birch tree I once claimed as my own. I would climb it, sit on a branch, make poems, tell secrets to the one friend who was allowed to enter that privacy. I thought that tree was my discovery. But then I found out that my father had it as his when he was small. So did my grandfather. You can climb it. Then Smes, which must have housed a blacksmith long ago according to its name. Three old bachelors are living there now. Old Fred tried to coax me up into the upper floor of the storage house once. But I was 10, and I knew the reason. I didn't go. And that's about it. Grelsbyn. Six homesteads. Continue. When you pass Smes, cross a small wooden bridge and follow the lowland to the town. Over Kalix. You'll know it by the church. Over Kalix is really a county, and this town is the church town, the centre of the county. We always call that town Brenna, the burning, but the maps don't say that. Church after church burned down. The one before the present one burned the night I was born. <laughs> Sometime in the 19th century, when there was a war with Russia, and, Rus and the Russians came to northern Sweden, some soldiers asked uh, one of the local farmers to tell them how to get to the church village. They wanted to take the church treasure. And the farmer told them to get into his boat. He would take them there. He started rowing them down river, ignoring the waterfall. When the Russians realized what was up, it was too late. Just before the boat capsized, the farmer jumped off onto a rock that still stands in the middle of the falls. All the Russians drowned. I don't know the country too well further north, but I would like to travel it. The names are strange. Some in Finnish, some in Lap, occasionally some in Swedish. Did I tell you that the word for river is elv? And elva is elf. It is the same word, really. Kabnekaise is the highest mountain in Sweden. That's where Kalix begins. I want to go there. I'm writing to you, but it is I who must go there. Maybe we can go together. 
I know the languages spoken in Karlix and Erva Karlix. I know the currents. My sister almost drowned in that river. My brother almost drowned in that river. I learned to swim in that river. I would like to know how other people can divorce themselves from a landscape. I am inseparable from that river. The stones and the nipples are related. Seagrass and my hair. Just as the water carried me when I, in my first conscious nakedness, floated down river feeling the water as an imaginary lover touching me, so the water touched grandfather's horse as it swam behind the boat, I rowing, the large eyes of the horse rolling its fear of the water that would touch the horse to me. The logs that were cut in the forest and piled on the ice to float downstream after the thawing rolled and dunked me in the water when I tried to ride them and scratched my thighs for all time to come. The river fed me pike and perch, yards of silver-scaled salmon, and it sent the loon to call me down in the spring. And when the images get too pretty, the mist rising over pink water, when my first love and I paddle Tours canoe over the flooded island, paddle between the partly sunken pussy willows on watery ways that the midnight sun had covered with gold. The river breaks. It sucks my cousin down into the wild current by Stadholmen to carry him downstream forever. And it calls me to go upstream like the salmon, to startle the moose and the bear, to come to the place above the tree line where the first drops of melted snow seep out of the black rock of Kabnekaise. Kabnekaise. The name sounds like a half-crazed woman who lifts her skirts to scare off the wild. After good night, when I am in bed, I remember the things that I did and what Mama said. The friends who teased and the ones who praised, the kitten that fit in my hand and the dog that I raced. When the room is dark, I can almost hear the great bear that roams around the North Pole pull loose walk across the heavens and rub his blue-black fur against my window. He is large as the night, but I do not fear him. I walk into my dreams knowing he is there. I have the great good luck in life that when I sleep, I dream. And my dreams are always beautiful. This gift of dreaming, it runs in my family. It's highly valued by all of us and makes us feel that we've been favored above other human beings. An old aunt of mine, <clears throat> she used to asked to have written on her tombstone, she saw many a hard day, but her nights were sweet. The first characteristics of my dreams is this. I move in a world deeply and sweetly familiar to me, a world which belongs to me and to which I myself belong more intensely than is ever the case in my waking existence. 
those cherished places within or towards which I travel, those friends infinitely dear to my heart whom I am rushing forward to meet and from whom I cannot bear to part, I have never seen. The second characteristic of my dreams is their vastness, their quality of infinite space. I move in mighty landscapes among tremendous heights, depths, and expanses, and with unlimited views to all sides. The loftiness and airiness of the dream come out again in its color scheme of rare and luminous blues and violets and mystically transparent browns, <laughs> all of which I promise myself to remember in the daytime, yet there can never recall. Long perspectives stretch before me. Distance is the password of the scenery. At times, I feel that the fourth dimension is within my reach. I fly in dream to any altitude. I dive into bottomless, clear, bottle green waters. It is a weightless world. Its very atmosphere is joy. The crowning happiness, unreasonably or against reason, is that of triumph. For we have in the dream forsaken our allegiance to the organizing, controlling, and rectifying forces of the world, the universal conscience. We have sworn fealty to the wild, incalculable, creative forces, the imagination of the universe. Some people tell me that the capacity of dreaming belongs to childhood and early youth, and that as your faculties of seeing and hearing ebb away, your talent for dreaming will go with them. My own experience tells me it's the other way. I dream today more than I ever did as a child, and in my present dreams, things stand out more clearly than ever and more to be wondered at. Already now, I feel that day is a space of time without meaning. And that it is only with the coming of dusk, with the lighting of the first star, of the first candle, that things will become what they really are and will come forth to meet me. The unruly river which has bounced along wildly, sung out loudly, and raged against her banks will widen and calm down, will end the fall silently in the ocean of dream and silently experience the supreme triumph of unconditional surrender. I thought I could fly. I did. I did fly. The sky was my road, and I was floating, swooping, sweeping the air with a, a pair of wings, like a hawk or a swallow. And then I woke up here on my pillow. So I guess I was just sleeping. <laughs> a couple of decades ago, my mother found in an attic in Grelspin a bundle of letters. She didn't know who had written them or where they were from. The house where they were found has been in my mother's family for as long as written history is recorded in Eva Kallix, over 350 years. She translated them from Old Swedish. Ian Hart brings you Letters from Signe.
wife, all his wife's brother from the West Village is going home. I asked him to bring this to you. Today, I have thought about your name, yours as part of the word blessing, Val Signet, signature, God's own signature, maybe. Mine simply Helga, but part of the same word as Helgon, Helig. It is perhaps an accident of fate, but does God play games of chance? Are our names some holy gift we carry and must live up to? These are strange questions, perhaps. Don't let them worry you. Maybe this questioning is the journey. Everything I see makes me ask, shows me my face in a new light, shows me God in a new face, in your face, Signe, my wife, I have written a song for you. Sing this in the evening. When I started to turn away from the life on the farm and spend more and more time praying or lying in the dark inside the cabinet bed, you brought me the lute sometimes and said that everyone missed my playing. It had become a habit, songs in the evening. Then one night, you didn't bring me the lute. Where I lay, I could hear a, a tentative strumming, then a soft humming, then your voice, first uncertain and then with an assurance that surprised me. I hadn't even known you could play. When you left your mother's house, you started to braid your hair and wind the braids tight around your head. As Ongmora, new mistress of the house, you slowly took over the responsibilities of the woman's work on the farm. It seems your hair, you kept it all in its tight reins, carefully controlled on top of your head. Only in the evening, when you came to me in your white linen, was your hair long and flowing down your back, and then over me, that song that you sang that first evening when you told me that I could leave, told me you understood my need to go, told me that you would sing my songs in the evening. This song is for you, Signe's song. pilgrims here, all travelers, at camp a fortnight ago, 
There was a girl with, without hands, a child, really. I spoke to her. She looked at me with such large eyes but did not answer. Her parents said she could speak but would not speak. The whole family is traveling together. In the evening, she disappeared for a while. When she came back, her arms were full of flowers. She gave them to me. Her mother said, but look, she does speak to you. Having watched you so lean over the riverbank to reach the first marsh marigolds in the spring, or seen you stretch for the blossoming choke cherry, I know the need for hands. The speech of gesture, speech of song, the speech of flowers. There must be some place, a country, where flowers are the language between men and gods. Wife, I think of you. I think of your body. I think of the many languages I will use when I return, God willing. If you think of me in the evening sometime, when the summer light lingers, go out into the meadow. Speak to me in flowers. Helga, your husband. This is their wedding picture. Papa wears a tuxedo, and Mama is wearing a white satin dress. She's smiling at the lilies. This is the house Papa built for Mama when they were engaged. Then this house, then that. They were always making blueprints together. Mama came from Lapland. She was quite poor and dreamed of pretty dresses. Her mother died when Mama was small. Papa met her when he came to Lapland as a conscientious objector. He preached in her church. There he is, in his banjo. Papa was quite poor too. Everyone was in those days. He told me he didn't have any shoes that fit him. One spring, and he had to wear his father's big shoes. Papa said he was so ashamed that he walked in the ditch all the way to school. Papa was one of 11 children, but only five of them grew up. The others died of tuberculosis or diphtheria. Three died in a six week period. And Papa says that death was accepted then, just like changes in the weather and a bad crop of potatoes. <laughs> His parents were religious. I remember Grandfather Anton rocking in the rocker and riding the reaper. And I remember Grandmother Maria, though I was just two when she died. The funeral was like a party. Birch saplings decorated the yard. Relatives from all around came. And my sister and I wore new white dresses. Listen to the name of her 11 children. Anna Victoria, Carl Sigurd, Johan Martin, Hulda Maria, Signe Sofia, Bror Hilding, Judith Frideborg, Brynhild Elisabeth, Jon Rudolf, Tore Adils, and Klari Torborg. <laughs> we called the eldest Tora. She was fat and never got married. Tore was the youngest son. I remember sitting next to him, outside by the flagpole, eating blood pancakes after a slaughter, and calf dance, a dish made from the first milk a cow gives after she has calved. Tore recently left his wife and took a new one. He once told me, when he was a boy, he used to ski out in the dark afternoons of the north and stand still, watching the sky 
and feel himself get smaller and smaller. This is Uncle Rudolf in his uniform. And this is Torbori, Papa's younger sister. <laughs> her fiancé tried to make love to her once before they were married. <clears throat> and uh, Mama told me, Torbori tore the engagement ring off her finger, threw it on the fl floor in the large farmhouse kitchen and hollered loud enough for everyone to hear, what does that whoremonger think I am? <laughs> Yeah, he was the son of a big city mayor and well-educated. But you can bet he married a virgin. Oh, don't they look good in this picture? Three of the five children are doctors. They say that Torbori got her temper from great-grandfather. When he got drunk, he cussed and brought the horse into the kitchen. <laughs> this is the Kell people from the Kell farm. I'm told that I have Kell eyes. Everyone on this side of the family hears ghosts and dreams prophecies. To us, it isn't supernatural. It's natural. Mama's oldest brother, Carl, went to America when he was 18. And there he is, chopping a redwood tree. And there he is, working in a gold mine. He married a woman called Vivian, and she visited us in Sweden. Let me tell you, whoo -hoo, the village had never seen anyone like her. Not only had she been divorced, but she had bobbed hair, warm makeup, and dresses with padded shoulders, matching shoes and purses. Vanity of all vanities was quoted from the Bible. So, of course, everyone knew the marriage wouldn't last. Besides, they didn't have any children. Uncle Carl is now old and fat, the darling and benefactor of a Swedish old folks' home in Canada. <laughs> Silver Mines helps him. Ah, this is Mama's second brother. He had to have a leg amputated. I used to think about that leg, all alone in heaven. Ah, oh, and this is Aunt Edith. She once gave me a silver spoon that had my name written on it. And this is Aunt Elsa, who has a large birthmark on her face. I used to wonder what mark I had to prove that I was born. Mama's father was a communist. He came to Lapland to build the large power plant that, light, that supplies most of Sweden's electricity. He told me once that he ate snake when he was young and worked on the railroad. His wife, Emma, was a beauty and a lady. And when the household money permitted, she washed her face with heavy cream and her hair with beer and egg whites. My hair. Hmm. Both my grandmothers had hair long enough to sit on. I am talking about my inheritance. The family jewellery that I wear in my hair, so to speak. The birthmark that stays on my face forever. I am motherless in Lapland, brought down to size by the vastness of the sky. I rock in the rocker of old age and re ride the reaper, while some part of me has already proceeded to heaven. I change one husband for another and toss my ring furiously moral at any indignation. I am a pacifist. I am a communist. I am a preacher coddling my father's language and abandoning my mother tongue forever. I eat blood pancakes, calf dance, snake, and I bring the horse into the kitchen. I build new houses, dream of new dresses, bury my parents and my children. I hear ghosts, see the future, and know what will happen. If I step on a crack and break my mother's back, I can say the shoes were too large on my feet, for I know, I know, 
These are the fairy tales that grieve us. And save us. Esther Hallman was the best. We never had words. Never. Never a bad word. But I knocked her up. I didn't know I knocked her up. When my mother was in the hospital in Yokmuk, Esther visited her every day. When my mother, she was there every day. And I guess that Esther was stuck on me from the beginning. Me. I mean, when I was there, I was racing, skis, and I was good. I came in third at the time. I was just 16. Usually I came in first in Lapland. I was working on the railroad. Could lay 53 ties a day. That was the record in Sweden. But 10 years later, when I was in Canada, someone beat it. They say 57. But while I was in Sweden, I held the record. So when this bastard told the boss that I was goofing off and got me fired just because I had left work early one day, I beat the bastard up. I had left my job, hadn't left it, I was working under contract and I had already laid 40 ties. Yeah, I was drunk when I beat him up. So they put me in jail for seven days. And when I got out, I went right to the railroad station where that bastard's father was station master. He sat behind this glass window, and when he looked up and he asked me what I wanted, boom, right through the window. I didn't really knock him out, but boy, did he fly back. There was glass everywhere. Ha <laughs> ha, you should have seen it. Now, I knew they'd be after me and that the police would be smart enough to check at the train station, so I walked through the woods to a place where the train had to slow down. And when it came, I waited for the last car, and I swung myself on board. And I went to Galavar, where my mother had a sister. But I was afraid that they would catch up with me there, so after three days, I took the train all the way down to Istad, where my mother had another sister, Hannah. Hannah was not neat like my mother. Never mind, she was good. The whole family was, and they helped me get a job digging potatoes. But digging potatoes was no job for somebody like me. So I went to stay with another aunt in Gothenburg. Her husband got me a job as a longshoreman. We were supposed to shovel up coal and carry it in boxes. I thought, well, that's easy. I was strong, and I was fast, and everybody noticed. But when I was almost done, I saw the smaller pieces were left, and they had to be picked up by hand. The other guys laughed, but one man, who was a good guy, he, he said, I can see that you're a greenhorn. Let me show you. And he did. Then I got a job mixing cement, which I already knew how to do, so I made good money. Seven crowns a day. Not a week. I mean, seven crowns an hour. An hour. Seven crowns an hour, that was, that was more than a dollar, and that was a lot in the 20s. And when I had enough, I took a boat to America. My mother died when I was two days out to sea. Or was it two days after I arrived in New York? I don't remember. I can't remember everything. My mother had hair that was so long that she could sit on it. <laughs> And she was, she was kind. And it makes me want to cry when I think of her. They say that our dog Jack missed her so much that he howled on her grave every night. 
and they, they had to shoot him. But my father, now there's a son of a bitch. I had to start working when I was six. Six. I had to do the rowing when we went fishing. And in the winter, I had to push the sled full of fish all the way home, 20 kilometers. Sometimes I did it on my skates, 20 kilometers going, 20 kilometers back. And that is a lot for a kid. And I had to carry in all of the wood for heating the house and for cooking and stack it and chop it. I was supposed to work on a farm in North Dakota, but I jumped off the train outside Chicago and I went to Canada. And then I went west. I wasn't made to shovel shit. First I logged. Right after the first week I did everything on contract. I saw what the other guys had got done and I knew how much they got paid. So I went to the boss and I told him I wanted to be paid per tree. I had seen him watching me work. So when he said no, I said, I quit. So of course he kept me on contract. He was no fool. I logged all over the Yukon and British Columbia. Sometimes it was 50 below zero. Do you know how to survive when it's 50 below zero? You dig a large hole in the snow, you cover it with logs, and on top of them you put branches. Spruce is nice. It's nice to sleep on. And then you build a fire under the logs so that the heat slants toward the place where you are sleeping. And that's how you keep warm. It also keeps the wolves away. I mined all along. And for three years, I was on a fishing boat as a cook. Those guys never ate better. Yeah, things were tough. But nothing's easy. During the Depression, I had no money for food for 12 days. For 12 days, I walked across Vancouver Island. I ate whatever I could find. Worms. I can eat anything. Seagulls don't taste very good. <laughs> but you can eat them if you have to. I figured Sweden couldn't be much worse, so I beat a freight train from Vancouver to Montreal on top of the boxcars, me and another guy, then on to Halifax. And when we got to Stockholm, we went right to the place where Esther worked, Dahlberg's Restaurant. I had the address, small grant number two. I can still remember the meal that we had. It was a fillet of beef with horseradish sauce. You bet it tasted so good. Esther and I had some good times. Only good times. She liked to dance. I remember we went to the Grand Hotel and we danced and we danced and they were playing the Charleston and my legs were so good when they were good I just couldn't keep still. Everybody wanted to know who I was. Who is this guy? And all of the elegant ladies, they wanted me to teach them the new steps but I danced more, most, mostly with Esther. You should have seen us. But the Farlings man, what's the word in English? He was after me to sign up in the army so... I took off. People were starving all over America, but that was better than being in the service or in jail. I had been in Stockholm for six months. Esther wrote me, but I didn't get the letter for months. I had moved three times looking for work when I finally got the letter. It was too late. She had gone to a midwife and gotten rid of it. And then she moved, and I couldn't get hold of her. She had wanted to come to Canada. I, I was her first. I know. I saw the blood. She was a good girl. Then, then I began making beer and hard stuff, got very busy. 
Well, I made the best stuff in all of Canada, just like it said in the newspaper clipping that you saw. It was shipped all over the country, to the United States, too. And this was during Prohibition. I supplied all of the bootleggers around Vancouver. It was the purest stuff made in the whole country, like the damn paper said. They looked for me for the longest time. I had a house on a hill in West Vancouver with the still upstairs so the booze could run down to the bottle downstairs. And one day when I was driving off on a delivery with the trunk full and the car too, I saw this car in my rear view mirror and I gunned it. You should have seen us up and down the hills and speeding around the curves. It was a hell of a chase. Yeah, sure, I did some time. Not too long. And a lot of people were going thirsty. Now, Al Capone, he was all right. He never dealt in drugs. They should shoot drug dealers, boom, right on the spot. That's bad stuff. But Capone, he never bothered with drugs or women, just bootlegging. No, no, I, I, I didn't meet him myself, but someone did on my behalf, and they said that he was, he was a, a civil man, polite, and you could trust him. But I did meet Bing Crosby. <laughs> he was a fine man. I mean, you could see it in his face. We were talking horseshit. I was trying to corner the horseshit market <laughs> on the West Coast. And Crosby needed some, because he was, he was growing mushrooms. I went there twice to Hollywood, second time he wasn't there. He was, he was sharp and he was kind. But his sons, that's another matter, stuck up and empty headed no goods. I also met Victor Mature, big phony. Well, this was after me and Vivian split. So you met her when she came to Sweden, huh, in 46? I don't know if you know, but my brother came to Gothenburg to meet her at the boat, and he saw her kissing this other guy. But that wasn't the only problem. I had been working up in the Yukon, and I had sent her all of the money that I had earned to put in a bank. She did, but only in her name. She sold the house too and bought another one. Instead, only in her name. And she bought a restaurant in Seattle. No dummy. And she was a good dresser, nothing fancy, just good classy stuff. Anyway, when I got back and I found out that she had been putting everything in her name, well, we were out for dinner and she was showing off talking about it in front of others. So when we got outside and we're standing by the car, boom, just like that, right in the face. That was that. <laughs> no, I'm not sorry I smacked her. I had trusted her. She had double-crossed me. She had taken everything, and all I had left was my truck, and that's why I started the cement business. But that warehouse that you saw and made foundations and sidewalks and driveways, I built my share of Vancouver, and I continued to mine all over British Columbia. I staked 18 claims in Lillooet. It's a crown grant registered with the Queen. We put out a 392-foot tunnel, and there's ore there that gets 2% gold of every ton. Do you understand? As silver and zinc and lead. The main vein runs visibly for 500 feet, and there are other veins. We've cut a road in over the hump of the mountain. It's 6,000 feet high. The road is 15 miles long. I have a claim near Alberta border too. It used to be the only party mine. But now I own, I own the whole thing myself. And I got a mine up there in Yukon near Alaska in the Keno Mountains near Keno City. Now, Vivian had a restaurant up north, too. Did quite well. She was smart, except when it came to me. And could she sing? Her voice was so sweet. 
There was one song that she sang over and over, The Blue Bird of Happiness. Do you know it? So be like I, hold your head up high, till you find the bluebird. She sang it better than me. When she sang it, everybody cried. She would sing it at parties. They wanted her to sing it on stage, but she had terrible stage fright. Too bad she had stage fright. She wanted us to remarry later, but I married once, and that was that. She died of cancer when she was 63. I used to go up and see her. Now, Esther Hallman, she was different. We never had a word, never. I didn't know I had knocked her up. When I finally got her letter, it was too late. I want to send her some money, $5,000, $10,000, maybe twenty. I saw her in Bowdoin, 1983. She's married, has a husband, children, and grandchildren. I visited them at their summer place. No, no, we didn't talk about it. I mean, that happened in 1932, for God's sake. I mean, what's there to talk about? I mentioned her in my will, but I'm going to ask the lawyer to change it. I don't want her husband to get it. If she dies first, I want her to have it. <sighs> she was the best woman I ever knew. I want you to be sure to write to her for me. Say that in the letter. Tell her that I'm sorry for what I did. Tell her that I didn't get her letter until it was too late. Tell her about the, the stroke so she knows that I, I can't write or read, except the numbers in the stock market report. I, I used to read all the time. I like to read Marx, Spinoza, Schopenhauer, History of the World. I've read them many, many times. And my book on Einstein. Pain? I'm in pain all the time. But that is that. It's feeling so weak that I can't stand. And worrying if anybody will find me if I die. I don't want to lie here and rot. I told the accountant that if I die, my body might, might be in the room stinking for days, so he's promised to phone every day. I told him about the place in North Vancouver, the place where they burn people. I, I told him what to do. Throw the ashes in a garbage can. Or in English Bay. But... If I get over the operation, who knows, I might be around for another 77 years. <laughs> and when I get too bad, I know what to do. I can do it myself. I mean, like, I, I cut off that goddamn finger. I, I had cut off a part of it logging, and the goddamn stump was in the way all the time, so I chopped it off on purpose with a little whiskey to help. Well, maybe, maybe not a little. I still like whiskey, but I don't drink much anymore. My legs, they're giving me trouble. I could just chop them off and be done with the pain. After the stroke, I was in the hospital for a week. When they let me out, I, I didn't know where I was, and I couldn't read the street signs. But I, I knew that I had to go toward the mountains so I walked. I, I didn't remember my address. So I just kept walking, block by block. First I found my way to my office, and then eventually to the apartment building, and it took me all day. Yes, this place is nice. We've got the super value, the Safeway, the bank, the 
fish market all within a block. Oh, and the park just four blocks away and two down to English Bay. And, and when I'm up, I can count the freighters waiting in the harbor. Sometimes I can count 12 or 15 from all over the world. I don't want to be in a graveyard. I want to burn. Put the ashes in the garbage can. What do I care? You'll throw them in English Bay. Salt shock. I don't want no funeral arrangements. Scattering the ashes in Lillooet? No. You don't understand. It doesn't matter what happens to the goddamned ashes. I mean, what's the difference? You're dead, you're dead. No, I don't have anybody. Except the accountant and the lawyer. And I talk to the broker almost every day. No, I don't want a nurse. I have managed by myself this long, have lived alone all my life, except those years in the 40s with Vivian. But you can call me. Call me. I don't want to lie here and rot. And that shoebox with the pictures, that I want you to keep it. I don't want anybody else to have them. And send Esther that letter to the address that I gave you. Tell her that I'm sorry for what I did in 1932 before Christmas. Tell her that I didn't get a letter until it was too late. Tell her I've thought about her all these years. Dear wife, it might seem strange, but now that I'm away, when my travels go well, and I'm getting closer to that holy place, my thinking is with you, in the evening and in the day when I'm riding. 
A dumb man came to our camp. He speaks with his hands. He looks at me intently, and then when I look up, he speaks with his hands. I try to speak back. I, I think he understands. It seems I am starting to know how we use gestures. We who can speak. How the words that are not quite formed yet move through our bodies and take shape at the end of their hand. This man, I do not know his name, tries to tell me about a holy place. He has traveled south, but he points north. Maybe he is not well in the head. Maybe that is why he cannot speak. But he seems wise, like the wandering preacher who told us of the journey. I showed the dumb man my casket. He looked inside. I was using the pen, and the casket was open. He saw the ring. He took it out. I was angry, but he shook his head, and he put the ring on my finger. I started to take it off, but he put his hand over mine, and he, he shook his head. Later that night, as I lay there, the sky was larger than usual, dark, many stars. I felt the ring, and I thought that the dumb man was right. I can be married to you and to God. Forgive me, Signe. I think of you and how you were at that time when you ran to meet me in the meadow. How we should not have run towards each other, but we ran, and both of us almost opened our arms, but we didn't. Instead, I said something about salmon jumping, and you said something about washing by the river. I guess that was the time we knew that we love. I am carving a whistle for Joseph. Helga. It is night with glaring sunshine. I stand in the woods and I look towards my house with its misty blue walls, as though I were recently dead and saw the house from a new angle. It has stood more than 80 summers. Its timber has been impregnated four times with joy and three times with sorrow. And when someone who has lived in the house dies, it is repainted. The dead person paints it himself without a brush from the inside. On the other side is open terrain, formerly a garden, now wilderness, a still surf of weed, pagodas of weed, an unfurling body of text, Upanishads of weed, a Viking, Viking fleet of weed, dragon heads, lances, an empire of weed. Above the overgrown garden flutters the shadow of a boomerang thrown again and again. It is related to someone who lived in the house long before my time, almost a child. But an impulse issues from him, a thought, a thought of will. Create, draw, in order to escape his destiny in time. The house resembles a child's drawing, <laughs> a deputizing childishness which grew forth because someone prematurely renounced the charge of being a child. Open the doors, enter. Inside, unrest dwells in the ceiling, in peace in the walls. Above the bed, there hangs an amateur painting representing a ship with 17 sails, rough sea, and a wind that the gilded frame cannot subdue. It is always so early in here. It is before the crossroads, before the irrevocable choices 
I am grateful for this life, and yet I miss the alternatives. All sketches wish to be real. A motor far out on the water extends the horizon of the summer night. Both joy and sorrow swell in the magnifying glass of the dew. We do not actually know it, but we sense it. Our life has a sister vessel which plies an entirely different route. When the sun burns behind the island, Signe, my one, I hardly ever meet anyone going home. Nobody to ride my letters north, but now I am riding myself. I have been to the holy cities in the south. I've seen the hill, and the white walls, and the shepherds. I have heard the strange singing. Wife, am I any more holy? Am I any more blessed? I am more sure and less certain of the answers. Do you, do you know there are many gods? Do you know there is a god that sits on a flower? Do you know there is a god that dances? Is it the spirit of the wings of birds that we worship? Do they worship the flower or the dance? Are all of them one god? Is everything one love? my love for you, my love for God. God knows I want, I want to see you, to hold you, to, to lift Joseph in the air and swing around with him in the wildest dance. I want the journey to be short, but Abraham's son is ailing. The moon is such as it was when best mother died. You know the place I showed you where the harebells grow white? Find some. Place them near the stone. Do it even if this letter is long in coming. If the season is such, the harebells are gone. You know the flowers I like, the small ones. When I come home, I will travel in books. I will find books from far away places. I will learn the habits of numbers and the shapes of letters other than ours. I will learn the names of flowers, the pictures in heaven. The North Star is low in the sky here. The big bear hardly leaves the horizon. I will learn why things are and tell you. We will tell Joseph. I want to work hard on the farm. I can almost smell the hay. I like the harvest. I want to throw hay high on the ricks and then when we are tired, drink milk in the shade of the hay barn. Your cheeks get rosy when you rake. I will make a small rake for Joseph and then a pitchfork. Here, women carry things on their heads. In some places, they hide their faces. Yours, open to the sun. According to the sky, the little I know, the potatoes bloom now, small white or purple stars. We will spend the days in the fields and in the evenings by candle. There are so many things to tell you and so few who are traveling home. Do you receive any of my letters? I have given you no way to answer but thought. Think of me, Signe, Helga. When I was a rider on my father's foot, 
ride a cock horse to Banbury Cross. I learned the names of the things in the room, chair, door, table, broom. Then the words for things outside, flower, grass, river, stone. And even things I could not touch, morning, evening, season, sun. Now I learn the names of stars, Vega, Mira, Danib, Alte, and constellations that are birds flying far above us, Cygnus the swan, Achaea the eagle, Corvus the crow. For I am a rider in a saddle-shaped universe that expands like the room where once I rode on my father's foot, learning the names of things. I am an adult. I can read. I have studied the universe. I know the Earth is a planet afloat in space. I know what a starry sky is, the starry sky under which I walk. I know it's not just a starry cap for our Earth, but the beginning of a vastness that stretches beyond the formulae of expanding space. It is winter. It is dark. The light from the stars in the arm of our galaxy shows its Milky Way. The constellations are almost as familiar as mother, father, grandfather. It doesn't matter if some night the serpentine northern lights snake across the sky, spitting fire like dragons, or if the moon is sickled, cradling an oval void, or if an enormous ring circles the moon so that someone will predict snow. This is my world. A starry sky and five people walking. My mother is wearing her black Persian lamb coat. My father, his beaver hat. She has her left arm hooked on his right arm, her right hand holding my brother's hand. The sheepskin line flaps of his leather cap are tied tight under his chin. My sister and I, we walk a few steps in front of them or behind them. Our white lamb jackets are trimmed with red wool. The circle around the moon is enclosing almost all the heavens. What does it matter if I'm in San Francisco or New York, if it is night or day, if I'm alone or not, because we are always walking there, and it is always winter. Down the Milky Way we go, with the swan, toward the bear. The Pleiades mirror us. My sister and I count and recount them. Five, six, seven. There were six of us before the baby died. Will we become seven? We do not doubt the correspondence. Or will yet another star fall out of our constellation to shoot across the sky, giving someone a chance to make a wish? And if one of us dies, would we still be walking down the Milky Way on this snow-covered road? The elevated road crosses the flooding plain. Nothing obstructs the view. Then the road climbs past a house, another house, some trees, two more houses, woods. The sky shrinks to a slender canal above the road. Mama says, do you have to go inside? I just went inside the door. Inside? The quotes are not exact. They um, have been obliterated by stars. But the image is clear. 
I can't see my father. Just inside the door. He is holding his hat in his hand, looking embarrassed. The woman he is facing has long brown hair, worn in a net-covered snood, like my mother. She is beautiful in the same way that my mother is beautiful. She is living in a white house, similar to the white house in which we used to live, on the same side of the road as we lived, as we live. I am an adult. I know about the theory of relativity. Time does not pass absolutely. The ticking of the clock is related to the motion of the worlds, tumbling through space. Years and minutes might have passed between the image of the dark woman with the snood and the blonde one I conjure up as my father says, she came riding on a bicycle. I can see her. Blonde, 22, just out of teaching college. She's come to the country for her first job. She is renting a room. She is riding a borrowed bicycle with a basket, say, with a loaf of bread and a woman's magazine with an easy crossword puzzle. He is tall and dark and handsome. He is 40. He used to live in this town, did well, moved to America. His brand new convertible rolls to a stop. It's summer. Her skirt flutters as she rides. The gravel crunches under the tires and under the sole of her sandal as it slips off the pedal and slides to a stop. And suddenly, she is pregnant. Words like divorce and remarriage enter the language. Time is relative. My first wristwatch had been my father's. It was a man's watch. The 14 karat Gruen that my first lover gave me on my 15th birthday was left unrepaired when it stopped. I was ashamed. It was, I was too young. But I am an adult. I can count. I know when the numbers don't add up. At 18, I'm seven months pregnant and not married and thousands of miles away from my mother, thousands of miles away from my father. But I must answer when a man asks, what happened? While I try to explain, he <laughs> looks at the clouds racing past the moon and says, Tonight, the sky has character. I'm an adult. I can create my own life. I am 37. We have driven the car right out onto the overgrown field. You have got to stop crying, he says. You're hyperventilating. But I can't stop. We've been lovers for a year. My husband knows all about it. It has torn what was left of our family apart. The air is full of fireflies. Above us, below us, they, they blink on and off, on and off, infiltrating the constellations, confusing what is earth and sky, insect and star, moving through space, stop crying. How can I stop? I blink, a twinned pulse. We are breaking up. I have ridden the destruction past falling, past passion, to the end. Knowing on some level this is not what I want. Not, not this world where Stars tumble out of heaven to wander will-o'-the-wisp in a dark space over a field overgrown with milkweed.
I am an adult. I can read. I know the letters as both sound and symbol. It makes sense that the Chinese ideogram for happiness is a combination of woman and son. The symbol of home is a pig under a roof. If I were Sequoia, I would devise an alphabet that could be shaped by cat hair brush or, or hog bristle or chiseled into stone. Each letter, a picture of something familiar. The symbol for family would be five people walking under a starry sky. The symbol for the future, a mirror held up to the past. In Sweden, they say the northern lights light up the night when the feet of wild swans are frozen in the ice and they beat their wings and they beat them and beat them trying to get free and the shadows of their wings fly across the skies. Dear Signe, it hurts to know how close I am, yet not quite at home. It seems I could reach my hands through the forest and touch you, but I can't. The air is a familiar cold, that blessed white on the ground. I cried when I first saw it. Like you, I ran out into it laughing, playing like a child. The horse stood by patiently, surprised. Who will be the wise one at the farm now, the one who says no? Or was that not wisdom? Signe, remember how Agnes's children made angels in the snow the first time we woke to snow together? I saw such angels today. I think they are the only proof of heaven I will ever have. I accept this. Almost home, Helge. Whoever received Helge's letters, and I sincerely hope that it was Signe, read them many, many times and kept her favorites on top of the pile. When my mother found them, many were torn at the folds and several were much more torn than others. Signe's favorites. There are more letters, stories, and poems we long to share, but there's no more time for them tonight. 
And now it is with great pleasure that I introduce the cast and musical geniuses who brought us Midsummer, a night in sensuous Scandinavia. Miana Burring, please stand. Jason Butler Harner. Bellamy Young. Ian Hart. Michael Nori. On percussion, Pedro Segundo. Bartok Glowowski on accordion. Lizzie Ball on violin. A special thanks to Jonathan Sachs who composed some of our music tonight. And on July 2nd, you're all invited to join us at the Arts Club on Dover Street for a special screening of In the Cosmos, a big show that Lizzie and Pedro played out in Los Angeles about the entire history of the cosmos. If you want to learn more about us, please, please sign up on your way out with my daughter, Steve Cedaring's granddaughter, who will take your email address. And, um, Again, remember that tomorrow is the summer solstice, the longest day of the year. We hope that you'll take some of these stories with you. My name is Cedaring Fox, and thank you for your attention.